Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective, part 50 of our in-depth study of the rapture, studying Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation side by side. But before we continue, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. This is part 50. And I'm saying that again because uh, we... We started this series with the purpose of doing a in-depth study on eschatology for the reason of me making my case uh, that I believe that the rapture of the church will happen before the tribulation period began. Now, let me say, as I regularly have said, uh, have said um, and, and so we, we can keep our consistency, our thoughts, the um, this study on eschatology, which is the study of end times, with a focus on the rapture. Again, the series started off with me making my case that I believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation period begins. Now, what is the tribulation period? It is that end time known as the great tribulation period or the day of the Lord in which God at a certain time in his sovereignty will judge the earth, the ungodly. Not only will he judge the earth, he's going to end sin evil um he is and, and by the way this it's kind of pictured here in this image that god gave nebuchadnezzar some 2600 years ago um in daniel chapter 2 this is a prophetic picture that he gave him of a human form representing five major world dominating kingdoms babylon the Medes and Persians, the Grecian kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and yet a yet kingdom that is to rise. Now we've studied this, as you can see, this is part 50, so we really unpacked a lot of this, which is the whole purpose. And we said that this brings us this image, which is a prophetic picture of the kingdom, five empires, um, four have come and gone, and then one is yet to happen. Now, the last world-dominating kingdom to arise, which would be the one of the feet and iron of clay, feet of iron and clay. And in, in Daniel, he said, in the days of these kings, then Jesus will set up his kingdom. And in the vision, in the revelation, the rock, you see, they're representing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, will strike this human form at its feet. That's the timing. So that's why we could see we are, we, we're, we're waiting on this last kingdom to arise, okay, which I'll get to in a moment more in terms of to plug in um, the details. Um, so it, it is doing this kingdom and I'm doing these kings, Jesus will set up his kingdom. Now, the image represents the time of mankind, humankind, in which the kingdoms, the sinfulness, the evilness, in which he is going to eradicate. That's why that, that's important to understand. Now, there's a lot of moving parts here. And that's why I wanted to do a deep dive. This actually started by me making my case that I believe that the church won't be uh, doing be here during the tribulation period. It would actually be raptured. There are three commonly held views on this position. There is what's called the pre-tribulation rapture view, which I hold to. There is the mid-tribulation rapture view. And then there are those who believe that the church will be raptured at the end of the tribulation period. Again, the tribulation period is that period of time. It is a seven 
year period, um, what is called the Great Tribulation, which we're going to get back to highlight in a moment, that Jesus is going to come and he is going to um, judge the earth. He's not going to come, I'm sorry, but he's going to judge the earth. Um, he's going to judge the earth for its wickedness. Okay. And that is one of the reasons why I do not believe the church will be here during this period of time. That period of time is very unique and specific to what is going on. So um, I'm going to circle back around to the tribulation period. But again, I wanted to do this deep dive study. Um, I, and and, it, and also it came from me responding to videos about the pre-tribulation period or the uh, the rapture when when is the church is going to be raptured i will also say none of the positions <coughs> none of the positions including my own position can produce a plainly stated the rapture will happen pre mid or post and i say that so that you could we could debate it we can have a dialogue on it but let's do it in love. A lot of people get unbelievably ungodly with their response, calling people false prophets, doomed to hell, all kinds of stuff. And it's silly because neither position can produce, in other words, I can't show you a verse where it says that the church will be raptured before the tribulation period began. So I have circumstantial evidence that I believe, but I cannot produce one. So anyway, that that's that okay um so with that i want to um get back into where we we're studying um let me back up again we're st the study of end times okay eschatology the study of end times and that's it it's simple you know it, it it's simple to understand but there is a lot of scripture, which is why we did this deep dive, that we looked at a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament prophecy to see what, what is the, the prophecies of the Old Testament. And the prophecy of the Old Testament is in continuity with the New Testament. See, so that, that and, and again, but in order to understand it, we have to, we have to know what it is saying. Now, when I say this, I said that, well, um, prophecy, as with all subjects of the Bible, is simple to understand. Simple. And this is what I mean. For example, the fact that God ordered, commanded Israel to wipe out a neighboring nation is simple to understand. It's not hard to understand. It's simple to understand. Wipe out the nation. Now, I may not understand why God did it. I may not understand, you know, whatever thoughts I may have on it, but that's easy to understand. That's what he told him to do. Now, of course, too, if you read other scriptures, you read further. This is why, again, if you read further, you'll find out why he said wipe out that nation. Because they were incredibly wicked. For example, some of the nations had detestable practices offering their children in in the fire sacrifices to Moloch to God. So that that's one of the reasons why he said that. Okay? So it's not hard to understand that and that's my point. You still might understand well God you were hard on the children and the women. True. But at least you understand what he's saying. So the same thing with end time prophecy. It's it, it's important to understand all both Old and New Testament, because there's no, the, the continuity is the same. For that reason, I'm going to also say, this is why you pay attention to details. And people, and people pl plug meanings from the Old Testament where they shouldn't. But anyway, more on that. Let's get to it. Let's share my screen. And um, let's bring up uh, 
Now, as I said, when we started off, we were just focusing on the rapture. And then um, then that's why I said, you know what, let's, let's just go deeper, really, really deeper, okay? <laughs> and um, so then I said, let's, so then I'm going to study both Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation side by side. So we've actually have, we're now in chapter 19. So we've studied every chapter in, in Revelation. And then the reason why I found this intriguing is because Matthew 24 is laid out similar to, um, um, to Revelation, the book of Revelation. So you have Jesus uh, saying here, let me do this just by way of reminder. In chapter 23, verse 37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, she who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing to see your house was left to you desolate. If I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. So this is Jesus' last words to Jerusalem, vocal words here. Okay, you're not going to see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To date, that hasn't happened. So, verse 1, chapter 24, as Jesus left from going out of the temple complex, his disciples came up and called his attention to the temple buildings. Then he replied to them, don't you see all these things? I assure you that one stone would be left here on another that will not be thrown down, and which we believe this came to pass in AD 70. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? What is the sign of your coming of the end of the age? So this is what this chapter is about. So the, from verses 4 down to verse 14, he's going to talk to his disciples, giving the disciples, which is then the church, his believers. What is going to happen with them? How do we know this? Look at verse number 13 says, but he, uh, look at verse 12, because lawlessness will multiply and the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be delivered. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Then he switches thought. <clears throat> In verse 15, he says, So when you see the abomination that caused desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Those in Judea must flee to the mountain. So he switches thought from a global back to Israel. Why? Because that's, when we go into the Old Testament prophecy, that is the bulk of prophecy. Send it around. What is going on? What is God's plan and purpose with Israel? So this is what we see right here, right? So then he said, so we see the abomination that caused the desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Again, we spent plenty of time. We went to Daniel. We saw the prophecies. The 70-week prophecy about Israel, the people, Jerusalem, the temple. So this is, he, 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 he switches back. So we see the same thing in the book of Revelation. The first three chapters, Jesus' message to the church. You can say his last message to the church. Um, and then he, from chapter 6 to 19, he talks about the, um, the, the unleashing of the judgments. So when we get down here in verse 21, he tells them, this is, we're back in Matthew, for at that time there would be great Tribulation, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and never will again, never will again. Now, so this great tribulation period, we see this in Revelation chapters 6 through 19. And now when we get to verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shine in its light and the uh, stars will fall from the sky, right? So immediately after the tribulation, period. Now, something I wanted to also show, uh, is it here? Oh, yes, it's here, okay. 
So this is where we are in the book of Revelation, where we're going to get to in a moment, chapter 19. Immediately after the tribulation of the days, right? He says the sun would be dark and the moon would not shed its light. The stars would fall from the sky and the celestial power would be shaken. Then uh, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all of the people of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. <clears throat> and they will gather his elect together from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. Now, some people see this as the church. However, I told you, pay attention to detail. This is this can't be talking about the church. And I'm going to save the more detail when I get to when I get to um, 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 circling back and around. I'm going to make the comparison. First of all, Jesus is not sending his angels for the church. Jesus himself is coming for the church. So then the other thing is, so who is the elect here? He is referring to Israel, okay? That Israel, he says, they would gather his elect from the four winds. Now, again, I'm going to save this in-depth detail for when I circle back around. The reason why we know this is because if you go to verses such as in Jeremiah 18, 17, Ezekiel 12, 14, and 37, 9, that's exact language that they speak of. Go gather my elect from the four winds, right? So again, talking about the elect here. Details. Another thing is he says, verse 32, now learn this parable from the fig tree and as soon as its branches become tender and sprout leaves, you will know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things recognize, when you see all these things recognize that he is near at the door, I assure you, this generation will certainly not pass until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Okay, so there's a couple of, again, erroneous interpretations that have come from this passage of scripture here. One, the fig tree, that a lot of people have, uh, erroneous have said that the fig tree is Israel. Nowhere that it necessarily said that. What John, what Jesus is saying here, he uses the fig tree um, as an illustration. How do you know summer is near? You can watch the development of the fig tree when it sprouts the leaves and fruit. That's all he's saying right here. Then the other erroneous interpretation was that uh, this generation, now some people also thought, well, a generation is 40 years. And the only way I could um, think that that interpretation came, and we'll say erroneously, is the language used of the children of Israel who came out of Egypt, who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And he basically, the language says, that generation wandered for 40 years. It didn't say that uh, a generation equals 40 years. I'm a generation. My children are a generation. My grandchildren are a generation. You know, so, and my great grandchildren are uh, a, a generation. So that's four generations right there. So it doesn't say 40 years, meaning that. But then he says, when you see all of these things happening, so all of the things that Jesus is saying, that, that's when he says, that generation, he says, uh, will not pass away until all these things take place, meaning what? The second coming of Jesus. Now he goes on, and um, I'm not going to go too into this here, because this is a warning about the second coming. Um, but let's go to um, hmm, let's go to let's go to Reve uh, Revelations chapter 19. Now, after all we studied in the book of Revelation, especially chapter 6, when we saw God unleashing the judgment, so the um, 
um, seal judgments were spilled over into the bowl judgments were spilled over into the trumpet judgment. Each set of judgments were more severe than the other. We also saw the kingdom of the beast. We saw the two witnesses. We saw the symbol of Israel. Okay. So after all of that, and then the last of the kind of world system was the judgment of the economical system, the great city that will arise during this time that John is calling Babylon, in which this great city will be a great economical power that God will judge in one swoop, one day. So then verse 19, when he says, after this, and that's what he was referring to after the the, the conclusion of these judgments concluding with this great city. What is interesting about the book of Revelation here is that we see that no other time in the history of man, fallen man, that we see that you have achieved such a time such a time as ungodliness. And let me give you an example. What stops a lot of ungodliness right here, and you could say a restraining, is God and the method that he's doing that. Even like now, when we think about how ungodly things are going, how ungodly things are going, you could say all of the different ungodly uh, element. If you want to say trans, if you want to say abortion. Um, by the way, the church is so foolish for engaging in this battle that they're losing because it takes them away from being the witness that Jesus told us to be because you fight this battle, but you ignore a whole lot of other stuff. But I digress. Um, right now, you have people that have to pretend, like think about gay marriage. And you could say, whenever they show that, if you notice, they always show the greatest examples. And you can't fight that, right? Two people loving each other, okay. Then you think about even atheism, right? And atheism is on the rise because again, the church is really not offering the biblical Jesus. They're offering a denominational Jesus, and that's what people are rejecting. There's this movement called deconstructing from Christianity. But they're, but they're mainly rejecting. If you hear their arguments, listen to their arguments. They're talking about structured religion, the hypocrisy of religion. Now, what I'm going to also say is that's just the front See, that's just the front. In other words, if you if I talk to an atheist and I say to an atheist, okay, fine, God doesn't exist. You, you see these YouTube about deconstructionists, right? Atheists. One who's making them, you know, and I'm not mad at them for making money, but they, they get they got huge followings on YouTube. But that's all the front. Because why are you making all of that? Why well, they call it deconstruction? That's why. But but if if God doesn't exist, like I would never ever, I would never have a whole movement, uh, you know, fighting against the existence of Klingons. Now, for those of you that don't know Klingons, that is a fictional character or set of characters or um, society in the Star, Star Trek universe. They don't exist because some screenwriter, right, wrote, made it up, or the Star Trek, Star Trek franchise made this made made up the planet. You know. Anyway, what well, I wouldn't fight it. I just, I just enjoy watching Star Trek. I'm not gonna go. Well, you know what? They don't really exist. They they really don't exist. So I'm going to spend all of my time fighting the Star Trek the Paramount, whoever, right, from Showing Klingons. Well, you have people right now that spend all their time to de destroy a in their mind 
a fictional character. I believe there's going to come a time where they won't have to have that front. And it's going to be during this period, this um, seven year period, where the total rejection of God will be evident. It, they won't have to, all of this fights here. They won't, have to, they won't have to pretend. They won't have to hide. Because right now, there's a lot, there, there could be a lot uh, at, 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 at risk jobs, um, opportunities, okay? Um, and if certain candidates get their way, it, it, it'd be even worse. Now, that's it. I think that's um, silly because they're fighting the wrong thing. But again, I, you know, so during the time of the Antichrist or the beast, the beast, there would be total, total um, ungodliness. But they will never, ever fully enjoy, enjoy it. It's like, God is going to make sure that they're never going to fully um, 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 enjoy it. Why? Because they will, um, 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 these judgments that's going to be plummeting the earth during this period of time. Okay. So again, if you go back, like I say, we spent a lot of time on this whole entire book. So now, after this, chapter 19, verse 19 says, After this, I heard something like a loud voice of a vast multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God, because his judgments are true, and his righteousness, and his right, and his judgments are true and righteous, because he has judged the notorious prostitute, that would be Revelation chapter 17 and 18, who corrupted the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his slaves uh, that was on her hands. Now, during this trip period of time, this seven-year period, there is going to be a lot of bloodshed. The result of God judging the earth, the ungodly earth, the result of that, The result of that, I think it's going to come, it's going to be over two thirds of the world population, just from God's judgment. Okay. Over that. And then you have those who hold true to the witness of Jesus, they are going to be slaughtered. It's going to be just open season. So that's why you see this. This, this, this phrase that continually come up that he had avenged the blood of his slaves uh, that was on her hands. Incredible. It's almost like if you name the name of Christ, you have signed your death warrant. Now, I would say during that time, to, from what we can see, it's not going to be the most pleasant time on earth. That's the first thing. So salvation in Jesus should be, and people are going to willingly die for their faith. It won't be like a, what you see today, a lot of the fake Christians today. Okay. Um, and that's why I said, even with, you know, you look at Hollywood, look at news, everybody, there's a, there are a lot of fake Christians. You, 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 you look at the Oscars and they will tell you, you know, I wouldn't be where I was at today unless the Lord Jesus. I want to thank my Lord and Savior for my Oscar, right? Fake Christian. They're fake Christians. And then a lot of people are Christians because they're prospering. But I believe they're going to, as I said, I believe it's going to come a time when they won't have to pretend. All right. Verse 3 says, a second time they said, hallelujah. Her smoke ascends forever and ever, meaning this great city at this time, Babylon. And they said, then the four, and then the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. 
uh, a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all his slaves who fear him, both small and great. Now, um, we see again these 24 elders. We, we're not told who they are. In other words, who comprises the 24 elders? It's going to be interesting to see who they are, but we also see these four creatures. Remember, these four living creatures go all the way back. We see them as early as in the book of Isaiah uh, and in Ezekiel. By the way, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see a lot of stuff that is just going to kind of blow us away. Verse 6. And then I heard something like a voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like a rumbling of a loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, has begun to reign. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has prepared herself. Now let's stop, because you know we have to look at this. Many people have assumed and concluded that the marriage of the Supper Lamb, this, 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 Marriage is to the church of Jesus Christ. Further, there are a lot of people who thought, who think, who have surmised that the rapture of the church will happen before the tribulation period begins. Right? Now, of course, as I told you, I believe that the church is going to be raptured before the great tribulation period. And it's just an opinion, right? I cannot, I cannot uh, present a clear-cut statement. The tribulation, I mean, the, uh, the, the church will be raptured before the tribulation period. No position can, no position can produce the church will be, the church will be raptured halfway through the tri tri tribulation period, or the church will be raptured at the end of the tribulation period. No, none of us can hold that. We just, we just have our views. And like I said, that's why we can debate it in love. But but the concept has kind of mushroomed in that what people believe is that the church will happen before the tribulation period began. And it is popularized in some of the modern day tribulation movies. And, um, and, 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 and here's my thing. While they're great... <laughs> while they are, um, I'm going to say my, they're great guilty pleasures. Um, all of these tribulation movies, where there's the thief in the night, you go back to the early seventies, the early seventies, the thief in the night, followed by distant thunder, followed by the, um, image of the beast, the trilogy. And then they, and they go back and they all have this view, this rapture view. This was also, Pop, even more popularized by the Left Behind series, which started off as a collection of books written by uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins, which sold a gazillion copies. So from, a, from an author standpoint, yeah, I wish I could have done that, okay? Um, and then later, you had a movie on the Left Behind movies. And then even re most recently with Nicholas Clay, they even got awful remake of the Left Behind series. I don't even know who did that, that Left Behind series. It, it, it was god awful. Okay, <laughs> let's get back. So the idea of the, 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 the theology though, which they show is that at some point, the rapture is gonna happen, and then you have the seven years tribulation period, okay? <laughs> it's always funny. I, okay, I don't want to get too deep into that, but okay, they're fun to watch. At least I, I, they're my guilty pleasure. But as far as theology, they are absolutely horrible, and they get it wrong every single time. Because in the Left Behind, as well as you know, in the Distant Thunder and all that kind of stuff, you have these tribulation forces and the whole host of other movies. If you just type in, you're gonna come up with them. The Revelation, tribulation force or these Christians who are going to, their aim is going to stop the Antichrist. They're going to stop the mark of the beast. 
They're going to destroy the computer chip, all right, the computer chip, which is the mark of the beast. And of course, these movies are based upon whoever. That that they they're so foolish because then if the Left Behind series is true, prophecy is a lie. If if you if you are a Christian doing the beast, and if your job is I'm gonna fight against the 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 beast, well you better read you better read because it says he will overcome the saints, he will make war with the saints and prevail against them. You're not gonna stop that. So anyway. But they also believe that the rapture is going to happen and that during the seven-year tribulation period of the rapture, they believe that there's going to be a wedding ceremony, okay, a wedding ceremony, which is then Jesus is going to be marrying the church and they're going to have a wedding ceremony, somewhat like a Jewish wedding. And Jewish weddings are usually like, a, it actually they call it a week or seven day period of time, but they, a lot of celebration. And they believe the church is going to uh, happen there. Now, that, <laughs> again, when I told you, when you read through prophecies, pay attention to the details. Um, it is a far fetched conclusion that during the seven year, great tribulation period that Jesus is going to be simultaneously having a wedding feast while at the same time afflicting the earth. You remember that in the book of Revelations, it is Jesus the one who was unleashing these judgments here against the earth. So we're going to be in this what big ballroom and Jesus is going to be sitting there, you know, afflicting the earth. So he's doing right. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So um, the one thing about the rapture is that we do know whenever it happens, whatever it happens, we will be with Jesus. At that point, we will always be with the Lord. Okay. So again, the other thing is, is that people have certainly just completely ignored what this, when it says the merit of the Lamb. So let me do this. Let me go down and show you um, what the Bible says about the lamb, okay? So this is verse 21. It says, I said, and I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband, okay? Then I want you to see something here. Uh, look at verse 9. Then one of the seven angels was at the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He then carried me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God. Okay. Now we get to that later when we get down to those that those chapters there. Um so um who was the bride then? Who was the bride of the Lamb? Right? Notice he said it's the holy city Jerusalem. Now just so we can understand the bride, uh, the bride, the church, when, when Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 5 compares the church and Jesus' relationship as a wife, a bride, that Jesus is cleansing, okay? So that is valid. Obviously, when I say it's valid, it's valid because first and foremost, you, we see it in Scripture. However, the church is never pictured. In other words, I understand the analogy that Paul is using versus, versus what is the church actually called, and the church is actually called the body of Christ. It is always called the body of Christ. Okay? All right, so um, 
verse um, verse eight again, she was given fine and fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb are fortunate. He said to me, these words uh, of God are true. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am your fellow slave with you and of your brothers who have the testimony about Jesus. Worship God because the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, you notice, and I could, so once I expect, we can say, well, you would think, well, John, doesn't you know better than to fall down and worship an angel? I think we just overcome with the brilliance of being at something we cannot at in at this stage relate to because of the our corrupt nature. But you also see that any true representative of God, any true servant of God, will always divert worship to God. Always. So if you see a guy that's taking glory to himself, right away, the false prophet. Um, so that's that's kind of this what you see here, um, this kind of preparation here of the lamb, okay, the preparation of the lamb, the wife. And then you see this glorious scene in heaven with a um, innumerable crowd of people. Now, most of what he's referring to is that these people are coming out of great tribulation. Now we come to verse 11. Then I saw heaven open. Now you remember, um, just so we can have a little continuity, um, let's go back. Uh, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun would be dark and the moon would not shed its light. The star would fall from heaven and the celestial powers would be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the people of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels. I'll get to that later. We'll come back to that. But we, we read that. But notice the picture of the it's a second coming. This is a bodily return of Jesus. So when anybody say that Jesus is not coming back, that that's a that is, um, you can say it's a heresy. It is a heresy. And I, <clears throat> when I say that, is that people can have this position out of a place of ignorance. It could be out of a place of ignorance. Okay. Um, but in a way, what is crystal clear is that Jesus will return bodily and every hour will see him. That is the second coming of Jesus. Okay. So, um, verse 11, then I saw, then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse, its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. So this, when Jesus comes back, this is what he's coming back to. Now let me stop. As I said, I didn't get into what's called the preterist view and the post-millennial view in this kind of setting here. I am dealing with pre-trib, mid-trib and post-trib, but preterist is a different category, which is one of the, to me, one of the most wackiest doctrines I've ever heard. Okay? Because one of the things they do is, in a sense, completely disregard the narrative, the second coming narrative. They just, and it kind of, and I don't know, just and almost like, it's just, they make it up. And one of the views is this, is that the events of, we can say Matthew 24, have already happened. So if that's true, then Jesus has already come back. But wait, that's exactly what they say. 
that post millennial and preterist, um, they basically say that Jesus has already come back. Somewhat, all right. Some of them say somewhat. Then they say, well, he took a, you know, he's come back in the spirit, maybe, and then he's going to come back at the end of the millennial reign. So they they go from bad to worse. <laughs> but then wait a minute, it even gets worse. They said, well, he he began to reign uh, when he ascended into the sky, and he um. So he he <laughs> he began to reign. Matthew twenty four has already come to pass, and he's not going to return until the end of the tribulation. I mean, the millennial reign. So the thousand years, he's not going to reign until the end of the thousand years. And when he comes back, he's coming back to a welcoming world. He's coming back, and the reason why the world will welcome him is because the church is going to fulfill the Great Commission by winning the world, or most of them. And so Jesus is going to come back and say, okay. Not one shred of evidence of scripture that I have seen them present to back that claim. So then you have to say right here in verse, again, 11, it's writers called faithful and true, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. So the heavens open, and what we're going to see is this writers coming to judge and make war, not a welcoming party. Okay. Verse 12 says, his eyes were like a fiery flame. And many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knew, knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the word of God. Okay, and he says, The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came out of his mouth so that he may strike the nations with it. And he will shepherd them with a rod of iron, with an iron scepter. And he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God Almighty. And he had the name, he had the name written uh, on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and the Lord of uh, Lord of Lords. So right here we see this vivid picture of Jesus' return. Okay. And uh, I want to explore this, okay? I want to explore this. But as far as preterism and post-millennialism, how in the heck do they explain this? I've never seen them explain this. And I can see that I haven't heard all of preterism. I haven't even really delved into deeply a lot of what they're saying, okay? So it'd be interesting to see, if you're going to tell me that Jesus is coming back to a welcoming world or here, He's coming back to make war. Okay, so he's coming back to make war. So I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to pick this up uh, and explore this um, in part 50. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, part 50. Okay, in part 50, or the 51. 51, I'm sorry, part 51. And uh, yeah, part 51, I messed up, all right. Um, because again, let's get the picture, the prophetic picture, and as I said, we're gonna pay attention to the details. We're gonna pay attention to the details. So I'll pick it up, and don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective, and as always, if you have a thought, a comment, Add it to the comments section below. All comments are welcome, and I do mean that. All comments are welcome. And um, so um, I will see you in part 51.